Welcome everybody out there at New York Comic Con Metaverse, man. It's me, Kevin Smith. How are you? Uh, welcome to a very special uh, moment in time, ladies and gentlemen. Quibi has gathered us together here today to talk about, honestly, the best new show that I've seen in all of 2020, and it's called Slugfest. Let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen, 2020 has been absolutely terrible. Thank God Avengers Endgame happened in 2019 because of... <laughs> Thanos knew that he had to go to 2020 to get the Infinity Stones. He wouldn't have done it because this year is so terrible. So we look for the bright spots. We look for the things to elevate, uh, the things uh, that will light a candle in this darkness. This show, Slugfest, is absolutely one of those shows, man. And for me, this was the show that I, as a kid, growing up reading comics, not just enjoying the stories of the characters themselves, but knowing the stories of the people who made the comic books, the artists and writers that I love, the rock star names of my childhood, you dream that there would be a behind the scenes show or somebody would do some sort of fictionalized version of the adventures of the Marvel bullpen or something. They did it, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, give it up for the cats who made it happen with their infinite movie power and whatnot. Uh, two of the greatest artists and, and hands down two of my favorite directors uh, existing right now. Uh, the Russo brothers decided to bring uh, Slugfest to life at Quibi. Boys, thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the panel. How did this happen? Set us up real quick. Did you read the book? I mean, this goes back. I mean, this is like you. It goes back to our childhood. Uh, you know, I've got a huge comic book collection. I started when I was a kid, uh, Marvel and DC. Um, and, uh, you know, same thing. I heard all the stories. Uh, about behind the scenes as I was growing up. So I was as fascinated with the folks who were working in the bullpen as much as I was with the heroes. Uh, and then, you know, Red Slugfest, loved it. Thought it was a great, um, you know, really accurate uh, uh, and balanced portrayal of, you know, the growth of the two companies that have dominated pop culture today. Uh, and just felt uh, like it, it it was something that, you know, the rest of the world uh, should see and that, you know, any comic book fan like like us, like you and us would appreciate. We live in a day and age where, like, if you tried this 15 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody would have uh, found a purchase for it. No, people have been like, what? No, it's too obscure. Now we live in an era where this could happen, man. And did you guys come up with it together where you, when you finished the book where you're like, oh my God, this has to be a show. It felt it, like that to us. Yeah, go ahead, Ernst. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was basically that. I mean, we, look at, we really feel very grateful, not only for, to be able to participate in these stories as sort of fans and readers, but also as storytellers ourselves. So yeah, like the, the opportunity to sort of like help carry the story forward, carry the narrative forward about how this amazing work that we value so much was made was like, yes, it was something we wanted to jump right uh, into. And we're so happy for this group of collaborators that came together to ex execute it from down in China through everybody. Um, and, I, and we want to announce here um, uh, something special. You know, Kevin, I'm going to embarrass you for a second, but your voice, Kevin Smith's voice has become almost Pavlovian for me <laughs> in terms of like, when I hear it, I know I'm going to hear fresh, creative, innovative thoughts on all of my favorite subjects. So it, it gets me going right away the second I hear your voice and it couldn't be more uh, thrilling or appropriate uh, that you, sir, are the narrator of Slugfest. And uh, we're very thrilled about that. I think audiences are going to enjoy it greatly as well. I was I was honored, and I'll tell you when I sat in with Don and Sheena and we did the the voiceover. I got to do all the narration, like I got to watch the episodes. And I I told them when I was doing the voiceover, I was like, I'm so glad that like I that I got to be involved because I if I watched this show and I wasn't involved, I would have been so <laughs> angry. Um, let's talk to these cats, kids. You came from a world we met previous to this project when you did uh, Batman and Bill, that documentary. Yeah. Um, was it a welcome return to the world of comics? You're now established in the space. That Hulu documentary is absolutely wonderful. Uh, were you approached by the Russos? How did this come into your life? Yeah, it was, a, it was through a series. Through our, we have the same uh, agent, uh, WME, and that's how the project came to us. And uh, you know, we, t we talked to uh, the Wonderverse team and, and Joe and Anthony about like how we can 
kind of take read source material and turn it into something that was fresh and exciting and Quibi being uh, a unique format for short form content, how we could kind of delve into these stories that I think a lot of people in the comic book world know a little bit of, but you know, for us as comic book fans growing up uh, and then getting into um, Batman and Bill, there's somebody, I'm more interested in how the, you know, the behind the scenes stuff uh, transpired that kind of created this, um, th this world. And, you know, for us to be able to dig back in to these stories uh, was just incredible. And it was just so, it's, and, and there's just so much, there's so much rich history that I just think like to, to know the stories within that made it to the comic book pages that are iconic, but to like peel back the layer and to see kind of what, what transpired behind the scenes and how things came to be and how these two companies we're always constantly battling each other and uh, to make each other better. And that the fans always benefited from that rivalry. And so it was a great, uh, great thing for us to be able to dig back into that, you know, the, the, the making of this, this world. With, with this, I think this completely solidifies you guys as the documentary comic book makers of the space. Um, you were- That's a niche market uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> the, your, your two producers are directors that have worked together. You two are two directors that work together. And I watched how you work together with me when we did the record, but how do you guys break up duties on set or do you, or are you just one mind, hive mind? I think we're a hive mind. I think that, um, I like to think we each have our unique skill sets. Um, I tend to be more academic about things. Um, Don is an amazing cinematographer as well, so he always comes at things with that visual lens. Um, but, you know, more than anything, we have fun together all the time, and we just wanted to, to make this and, and for the viewers to be able to feel as, as much fun as we had making it. And I hope, you know, when we speak to the other people involved that were there on set with us, whether it was a sit down interview for the doc or um, part of a recreation, we just wanted it to, to feel fresh for people who, you know, know the canon backwards and forwards and fun for people that might not, you know, know all the characters to be able to make it easily accessible and, and just a fun ride with some surprises in there. The whole time I watched every episode, I was like, oh man, no way, they're deep diving on this. And then you would do a deep dive on subject matter that like, to me, is in my genetic material. It built into my DNA from being a longtime fan. Who came up with the idea? Because I thought this was a stroke of brilliance. You know, documentaries, of course, now lately do a lot of reenactment footage. The reenactment footage stars people from the world of uh, genre works, from movies and, and TV shows about comic books and otherwise. Who came up with that very clever idea? I think it was us riffing, really, is we wanted to find a way to incorporate some of the, um, you know, stars associated with both the DC and Marvel universes, but to see them in, in roles and in ways that you're maybe not necessarily used to seeing them. So to try and, and have little Easter eggs in there for the fans um, so that they could have the joy that we had when we were making it. Um, let's, uh, before we jump into everyone else, I, do you guys have some key art you wanna share with us? Yeah, we actually have something specifically for the New York Comic Con audience. It's the, the poster for the show. I think you're seeing it right now. This is the first Look time that. anyone has seen Unveiled. this. Unveiled. So there you go. Exclusive. Exclusive. Just for you, you guys out there. <laughs> That's a keeper, man. That's going to go framed in the office. Congratulations, kid. This Thank is you. Absolutely beautiful. Um, Jeanette, you and I met many years ago when I was briefly involved with Superman, but I was thrilled when I watched these episodes and saw you get highlighted. And you even got played by Daredevil's girlfriend, man, Vanessa. Like, it was nuts. <laughs> Um, you are responsible for so much of what we now take for granted in the comic book community today. You oversaw the, the release of the first graphic novel into American mainstream, as well as created uh, co-created Vertigo, um, brought in uh, the British invasion, brought us the Watchmen, Neil Gaiman, so forth and so on. Uh, you're an icon in our world, and it was so beautiful to see you get a, a, a moment to shine, somebody shine that spotlight on you. How did it feel being depicted? How did it feel being a part of this history? Uh, thank you, Kevin. No, I must say, uh, 
when Sheila said that they wanted this to feel fresh, it felt fresh to me. And, uh, I, and I really enjoyed the talk because it's just full of good spirits and imagination and invention. And for someone who spent 27 years at DC, saying it felt fresh means a lot. <laughs> Did you ever imagine in any of those years you worked there? I mean, you were creating history just by working there in, in addition to all the stuff that you brought into the industry. But could there have ever been a moment in your 27 years where you're like, maybe this will be featured in a docudrama? <laughs> <laughs> that did not occur. <laughs> and I'm glad that it is now, not, not to shine a light on me or my accomplishments, but to shine a light on DC and Marvel and the comic industry and how we're such an essential part of the American landscape. And let's talk about that real quickly in terms of, uh, of course, you were at DC for so long, fans from the outside and even the name of the series called Slugfest. We always saw it as a battle between the two majors. What was it like on the inside? Were you ever mad at Marvel? <laughs> well, you know, we, we occasionally poached writers and artists from Marvel and they did from us and we would, you know, we'd have our noses would be out of joint. But mostly it was really friendly competition and we did make each other better. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Mr. Starlin, you, uh, Thanos Baby Daddy, you worked at both of those companies. <laughs> what was it like to work to straddle the fence, so to speak? And was it a Marvel versus DC world that we thought it was as fans? That was more for the companies, the fellow artists like myself, you know, we all hung out together and so there wasn't any competition going on there other than then who's going to be the best artist. Um, it was different. Uh, a lot of it depended on who the editor was that you were working with. The companies had sort of a different uh, feel to them. Marvel was more profit oriented. Uh, DC less so and more fiefdoms. They were more like the editors were more battling each other than uh, the other company sometimes. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. Um, so during that time, you crossed over with many uh, writer legends, artist legends. Um, you must have come across the editorial legends as well. Do you have any uh, Stan Lee moments during your Marvel times? Uh, when I first started off, I uh, used to do cover layouts with Stan, and he would come in in the afternoon, and I would bring in the layouts I'd done in the morning, and he would always go, great, terrific, terrific, but, and then he would get up on his desk to act out how he wanted the Silver Surfer or somebody to be, and while he was doing it, he would take off his glasses and put it on the seat, and about, oh, I'd say about every sixth or seventh time, after he got done showing me, he would forget his glasses were in the seat and he would sit on them. <laughs> and we'd hear this break and he'd reach over to the intercom, which I had back in those days. And he'd go, Holly, I did it again. And she would bring in a new set of glasses and uh, we would go on from there. <laughs> oh my good Lord. That's Season so two episode right there. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Brandon, you uh, uh, get to cross over uh, in the in your episode, uh, the first one with Stan Lee. You actually get to speak to Stan Lee yeah, as Joe yeah. Simon. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, very cool to 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 be um, making my first uh, appearance in a, in something Marvel related uh, as the creator of. Um, the the uh, Captain America, the and not the antithesis, but the Marvel equivalent of Superman. Um, so very on the nose uh, and fun to be able to do that uh, and appear in, in this way, and to work with um, a version of Stan <laughs> as well. Um, you've spent years now in the space uh, with a lot of us. Of course, uh, you've been Superman. Uh, you've had Legends. Uh, what was it like? to step back into comic book history and play the co-creator of The Great Captain America. You know, it, it's really great. And, and I really love uh, the first episode is very uh, poignant uh, for what's happening in our world today and the creation of Captain America and, the and all of the superheroes born out of uh, uh, helping the political uh, agenda at the time and, and the World War II specifically. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's so much history in these characters and that's why they mean so much to us. And they've been with us and they've been part of our society and have the ability to teach such great lessons. Um, you know, it takes that 
a bigger than life experience and story to kind of help us see things in a new way. And I mm -hmm. think it's a marvelous tool that we can use as filmmakers uh, to do that. And to learn the history behind it also was great. I didn't know this about Marvel. I knew a lot about um, Siegel and Schuster and, and, and DC, but not as much about Marvel. So I'm getting, getting educated as well. We all were. I mean, there's this, uh, every one of the subjects I knew a little something about, except for the one episode about the, the very first like cosplay um, uh, parade that it yeah. were, it, where was it Kit, Don and Sheena talk about that? Because that, that episode was obscure to me, but yeah. thrilling as a fan. Yeah, the Rutland Halloween parade in Rutland, Vermont. Yeah, and Jim was there. Yeah, <laughs> Jim, you went to it? Yeah, it was trivia on acid. <laughs> That's a, so the show was right. I remember in the episode, everyone's talking about like dropping acid and whatnot, and you can yeah, speak. Yeah, I, I remember a little bit about it. <laughs> I'll have to watch the documentary. Our first question um, to Steve Engelhart, he said, um, you know, well, I was on a tremendous amount of mescaline at the time. <laughs> you know, that's gonna be a good one. <laughs> Where you get the out of this world ideas. Exactly. <laughs> Truly, like, you know, so Every many good stories kids. starts with, I was on a lot of mescal in that time. <laughs> yeah, we, just, we just assumed people were creative. We had no idea drugs were a factor. Um, so comforting to know. Uh, to the Russos. Very seldom. What, uh, and to the Russos and also to Don and Sheena, what is the, how does one narrow it down to the stories that you picked? Like, was it a, a battle uh, or were the obvious ones floated right to the surface? And were there some that you left behind where you're like, ooh, next season? Yeah, it was it was tough. I mean, we wanted to, uh, it, you know, again, Reed's book is is so great because there's a lot of what, you know, what Reed is able to do in, in the book, to, he can kind of get into the minutia of sales figures and things like that. It's things that do not translate well to you know, uh, the film yeah. space. So, you know, the, the, the criteria was always, you know, the story first, and then within the story had to have at least a few turns to it. It had to go somewhere, it had to have a little arc built into it. And before I turn it over to, to the brothers, um, we found out some of these stories doing interviews for some of the other episodes. You know, we would talk to someone about something and they would say, you know what a good story is? And that would change things for us. We, we got uh, Reverend Billingsley that way. Get out of here, really? I'm yeah. telling you, once people see this show, you, you, all of you will be haunted by suggestions from everybody. Because once I finished every episode, I was like, oh, you know what they could do next? And you just wanted to be like, do this, do this, do this. Yeah, and I'll say this, Kevin, even though it's called Slugfest, is the show that is made with a lot of love and a lot of reverence and a lot of, this is an homage to um, the incredible creative brains that brought to life these characters that were so important to our childhood. And little did we know, uh, would be so important to our adulthood as well. Uh, and, and as Jeanette said, that have become intrinsically woven into the pop culture landscape uh, around the world. Uh, and so uh, we're just, we're so proud of the show and we're just so happy that the people get to share and the love for these creators the same way that we do. I'm telling you, I, I absolutely love it. It is one of my favorite things might've saved 2020 for me. The audience <laughs> is gonna love it. When does it start on Quibi? When can they start watching? November 9th on Quibi, only on Quibi. There it is right there, man. I, it, like, we'll, we'll be in the aftermath of something. You'll need this show, I assure you. November yeah. 9th, yes. we're all going to want to be together watching this. Brandon, uh, you've got a super surprise for us, don't you? Yeah, we got one more surprise for everybody in the uh, New York Comic Con audience. Uh, for the very first time ever, we're showing episode one publicly. Uh, yeah, which is pretty exciting. And uh, I'm especially excited because this is the episode I'm in. Uh, this episode is about the comic book creators, Joe Simon, uh, played by myself, and Jack Kirby, played by the very funny John Barinholtz, and how one of Marvel's most beloved superheroes rose to the shadow, uh, excuse me, how one of Marvel's most beloved superheroes rose in the shadow of Superman, just as the US went to war in the 40s. Oh, it's a great episode. We're about to watch it now. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us here on the panel. Thanks for everyone involved in Slugfest, uh, kick back, enjoy this. You're gonna wanna download Quibi instantly because this is coming your way, kids. Thanks for being with us. Uh, enjoy New York Comic Con. Uh, to all the Metaverse Thanks folks everybody out there. watching. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Thanks. everybody. Thank Thanks you. so Thank much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Take care, Thanks, folks. Bye. 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 
In a world of superheroes, two companies have dominated the space for almost a century. Marvel and DC are nothing short of a worldwide phenomenon, with films resulting in billions at the box office, countless TV shows, and a fan base around the world who defend their favorite characters with unrivaled passion. And this passion goes beyond core comic readers and into the hearts of millions all over the world to redefine pop culture, break down barriers, and change the way we see the world. These are the stories of an 80-year battle that forged a modern-day mythology. In the late 1930s, a hero named Superman, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, burst onto the scene and became a blockbuster hit. He was the first superhero to break out of the pages of a comic book and into almost every house in America. This was the moment in time that modern superheroes were born. Siegel and Schuster created the archetype upon which new mythology would be built. The hero from the planet Krypton had a repertoire of powers that made him larger than life, but he also stood for American values, truth, justice, and hope for becoming the best in all of us. Superman also helped turn DC Comics into an industry juggernaut, and Superman gave Americans a hopeful escape from the uncertainty of the time. At the time, World War II was brewing and the American public was desperate for patriotic heroes. In early 1940, Look Magazine, which was the second banana to Life Magazine, they went to Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, two Jewish kids. And they were asked to create a story, which was how would Superman win World War II? Superman flies over to Europe, and he pummels his way through the Reichstag. Basically beating the German army in like a half hour. There's an interesting panel from that story where Superman holds up Adolf Hitler and says, I ought to give you a non-Aryan punch in the jaw. Now, less than a year after the Look Magazine panels, before America entered World War II, a small publisher named Timely Comics, which would later become Marvel Comics, was trying to keep up with the competition. Timely Comics had already scored success with their superheroes, the Human Torch and Submariner, but they were always looking for their own answer to Superman. They turned to two of their creators, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, to find a new hero for the troubling times. You really need to understand what was happening in New York City at the time. It wasn't go America, let's get into this war and let's put an end to Nazism. There was a very strong pro-Nazi sentiment in the US at that point. The Nazi Bund in New York was an active and fairly large group. They had a huge get-together in Madison Square Garden that created quite a stir. Anyone who's good at heart saw this thing growing, and they saw this evil getting worse. Jack Kirby and my grandfather, they were both Jewish. They both had family over in Europe. I mean, this was hitting really close to home for them. And what else can you do? You create a way to do battle with that evil. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest. Looks like we found our villain. Hitler? We talked about coming up with our bad guy first, the foil to our hero. Seems like Hitler's shaping up to be the ultimate bad guy. So all we need is the perfect hero to face him. How about super American? I like the American idea. Super, I think, is probably overdone now. Everyone wants to be Superman now. Yeah, I got it. The American Captain. American Captain. It's almost there. Almost there. Daring at the time, the cover of Captain America number one showed Captain America walloping Adolf Hitler. Back then, Hitler was seen as invincible. He was on a roll. Poland falls, Czechoslovakia gone, France starting to fall. Joe and Jack came right out and said, Nazis are bad and we're going after them. For these men to decide that they wanted to speak up and speak out against it at that time is super brave. This was two guys making a very bold public statement in splashy red, white, and blue colors of what we should and shouldn't be supporting in this country. Captain America was a huge hit right out of the gate. This magazine flew off the stands. Kids loved it. Superman's awesome. That's someone to look up to. Truth and justice in the American way, and he's fighting all this crime and doing good, but I'm never gonna be Superman. Whereas with Captain America, well, he started out as a scrawny kid. 
just like I am when I'm reading a comic book as well. So it's very relatable. Captain America was like my first perception of what patriotism is. When I would buy those comics, I would read them, and I would become, in a way, in a very small way, but in a real way, socially conscious. And that's a big deal for a child. It was our way of saying anybody can be a patriot, anybody can be a hero. Not everyone was happy with that image on Captain America number one. The Nazi Bund in New York were not happy with Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. The timely comic office would get a lot of threatening phone calls saying that they would pay for what they did. People were calling and claiming that they were going to come and kill them. There were many declarations of death to Jews. It got to the point where guys were scared to leave the office for lunch. Timely Comics. I'll see if they're in, and who may I ask is calling. Mr. Kirby, Mr. Simon, the mayor of New York City is on the phone, and he would like to speak with you. Thank you, Stanley. Hello, sir. Joe here. And Jack. Hey, boys, it's Mayor LaGuardia here, and word is you're getting threats from Nazi sympathizers. Well, I just want you to know that the city of New York supports all that you're doing. Uh, thank you. We're just, uh, doing our part. The mayor told them that he would send some policemen down to guard the front of the office building and do whatever he had to do to keep them safe. Comics have taken a unique stance when it comes to a genre that some people think is only for kids, and yet they are educating adults and children on certain things that I think we as human beings should agree on. I feel like it was their patriotic duty, and if they had to receive these threats, I think it was worth it for them. Nothing derailed Simon or Kirby from continuing to publish Captain America, so by the time Pearl Harbor hit, Captain America was more relevant than any other comic book that was out in its day. Once the U.S. actually entered the war, the whole country was on the side of patriotism and America fighting the Nazis. I think it was important because there was a lot of people, 1940s America, that didn't have voices. Thanks, Stanley. Captain America spoke for everyone. Everyone can see a little bit of themselves in that character. Captain America's real superpowers weren't in a super serum. They were the normal human qualities people strive for. Jack, come here, you gotta see this. Qualities the US soldiers strive for. Loyalty, selflessness, integrity, and the courage to never back down when faced with a bully. Guess we're on to something. Marvel finally had something that was as big as DC Superman, and it put them on the map big time. I can do this all day. It would take Marvel another 20 years to become a true threat to DC Comics. But these early days of competition laid the foundation for their decades-long pop culture redefining rivalry. But even though loyalties ran deep in this world, one man suited up to unite the Titans in the most unlikely of ways. The festivities begin. 